hundreds of millions have been vaccinated, but how will we prove we're protected from COVID-19? Vaccine passports are becoming a global reality, but will their arrival guarantee freedom of movement or exclusion for those who can't access the shots? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today on The Newsmakers, we'll ask whether travel documents in an age of COVID-19 could exacerbate inequality. But first, we'll look at Armenia, where Nikol Pashinyan has secured a decisive electoral win. I'll ask if his new mandate as prime minister will change the country. Off the back of a devastating military loss in Nagorno-Karabakh, ironically followed by a landslide victory in a snap election, one of Nikol Pashinyan's biggest challenges now will be to build relations with Armenia's neighbors. Now, Sunday's election ended an internal political crisis that began in November when Pashinyan signed a Russian-brokered peace deal ending a six-week war with Azerbaijan that saw Yerevan cede large blocks of occupied territory in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region to Baku. Well, despite the unpopularity of what was widely considered a humiliating defeat, Pashinyan came away with nearly 54% of the vote. A bloc of parties headed by ex-president Robert Kocharyan, seen by many as a symbol of old guard corruption, won just 21%. Now, Kocharyan's alliance is alleging voter fraud and says it will challenge the results before the constitutional court, although no evidence has really been found to back up those claims. Now, watching the results closely were Russia and Turkey. Ankara backed Azerbaijan during last year's conflict. Pashinyan has told his supporters the political crisis is now over and he vows to follow through on promised reforms. So what does Pashinyan's victory mean for Armenia and could it mark a rebuilding of relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey? Well, joining me now to try to answer that are from Istanbul, Matthew Bryza, a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council and a former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan. And from the U.K., Samuel Romani, a researcher at Oxford University specializing in Russian foreign policy. Thank you both so much for being with us. Uh, Matthew, let me start with you. You know, I have to ask really what actually happened in the last few months that, you know, took Armenia from what looked like just outright rejection of Nikol Pashinyan mainly for losing the war in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, to handing him this huge victory in an election that even he was reluctant to call for. <laughs> yeah, Andrea, you've really asked the key question, and you and I have spoken about this issue so many times. And if you recall, during the war, I was out there predicting that, you know, Nikol Pashinyan was not long for this political world. And indeed, after the war, there was a, allegedly an assassination attempt against him and huge public protests against him for signing that uh, agreement or ceasefire statement of November 9 and 10. So what happened? Um, the way I interpret the election results is that the people of Armenia got tired. They got tired of a conflict with Azerbaijan that's led them nowhere except to a catastrophic, humiliating defeat. And maybe more significantly, they didn't want to go back to the old system. I mean, this really was a choice between Robert Kucharyan and the old, highly corrupt uh, Armenian system of the past that that led the people of Armenia to believe these myths of invincibility and that Azerbaijan couldn't fight and that, you know, greater Armenia was on the horizon with Armenia maybe going to reacquire territory, even in Turkey. Um, so I think when the Armenian people began to feel the psychological dust, if you will, settle after the loss of that war, they realized going back to that old system of corruption, of no economic growth, of, of, of a shrinking population was not the way to go. And so they didn't love Pashinyan, but they liked the prospect maybe of a democratic future, as was evident in his Velvet Revolution, more than the old regime. Fair enough. Uh, Samuel, let me ask you, I mean, in spite of the polls, you actually predicted that uh, Pashinyan would win. Uh, did you also see it as kind of just an outright rejection of the old guard as being a choice in this, in this term between the old and the new? Well, I think that it was more the scale of Pashinyan's victory that was something of a surprise because Kucharian had a narrow but four to five point lead in the polls. Some polls showed Pashinyan ahead. No one really expected a landslide. But I would say, yes, it is. it was a rejection of the former uh, Armenian system, absolutely, which the Kucharian represented and Sir Sarkisian represented. And the mistrust of that system was so high that even when Robert Kucharian said that he could negotiate a better deal on Karabakh than Pashinyan had, Nobody really believed him. Mm. And also, Kucharian was seen as uh, basically overtly asking for Russian interference in the election as well and asking for Russian assistance. 
And uh, as many would recall, the Russians really did not come to Armenia's aid during the recent conflict. And he was seen as trying to erode Armenian democracy from that respect. Right. So that's why I think that we should be uh, viewing this as a rejection of the old system. Okay, fair enough. Let's look forward then. And Matthew, I'll come back to you. I mean, how much can Armenia's relationship, in particular with, with neighbors Turkey and Azerbaijan, move forward now? Most importantly, you know, will Armenia be able to move on from the past, as you've highlighted, or will it kind of continue to somehow either demand that the United Nations reverse its recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh as Azerbaijan or uh, that Turkey change its stance on the events of 1915? I think this was the watershed moment in Ar Armenian politics, where if, if the body politic of Armenia wanted to do what you just said, Andrea, go back to revisiting 1915, go back to revisiting the, the ceasefire agreement that ended this war, and, and basically brought Armenia back in line with international law. Um, I think if Gocharyan had won, we would see continued instability and Armenia rejecting the open doors being offered by both Turkey and Azerbaijan for Armenia to reintegrate into the regional economy. So Pashinyan, having been the one who did sign that agreement, and by the way, the only agreement that was available because they lost the war in Armenia. So by, by choosing Pashinyan, I, I think the body politic in Armenia has said, okay, Let's let's accept those invitations of Azerbaijan and Armenia to build a new future together. Let's embrace the, the final paragraph of that November 9 and 10 ceasefire statement, which says that all transportation linkages are reopened. And let's embrace, mm -hmm. there was a January, a January 9th agreement as well, where Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia formed trilateral working groups at the deputy prime ministerial level to develop project, especially in transportation, uh, to restore the linkages regionally. So I think this is what the Armenian people have chosen, push, to push on an open door, if okay. you will, from Azerbaijan and Turkey. That's, 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 that's good to hear. I mean, but uh, let, me, let me ask um, Samuel, how much will Armenia and its own development actually miss out on if it doesn't reconcile with its neighbors at, that, at this point? I mean, we have to bear in mind that it's a, it's a landlocked country, uh, that's easiest to access only via Russian-based airlines. Um, how much does it stand to actually gain if it reconciles with, with Turkey in particular? Well, I think that Armenia stands to gain quite a lot because right now Armenia it has achieved sometimes uh, relatively high levels of economic growth. For example, in the year before Nikola Pashinyan was uh, installed in 2017, they were averaging 7.5% economic growth. They've got a pretty strong investment climate. The State Department was noting that they're in the recent report that they've got a lot of uh, liberal economic institutions that could be open for investment if they could take care of the cronyism and the corruption. Mm -hmm. So this is a country that's got a lot of growth potential, but it's really being impeded by its over-dependence on a single alliance with Russia and a sclerotic Eurasian economic union. And if it were to open up to its neighbors in a more uh, integrated fashion uh, in terms of Eurasian or Caspian integration, you'll be able to see a lot more investment coming into the country and a lot more connectivity. And Pashinian's election should also assuage international investors about a reheating of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict too. But will Armenia follow that course? Will Armenia accept Turkey's plan, which is to integrate Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iran into this kind of Caspian, Eurasian, interconnected economic system? I think we're far away from that. Matthew, do you also think that's far off? I do, I do. And I think there's a lot of uh, geopolitical uh, hesitancy outside the region, I mean, whether it be in the United States or in, in European capitals, about having Russia and Iran integrated in that way. Um, and I think, you know, we, we still need to give Armenia some breathing space. I mean, psychologically, having lost the war uh, was a catastrophe, probably that's the worst since 1915. And so they've taken a big step now in embracing a democratic future and one that at least doesn't want to reignite the conflict with Azerbaijan and in, in principle accepts the, the November 9-10 agreement. That's a big step. And as Samuel was suggesting, it may not hold. I mean, Armenian politics may shift again, but for now, for now, Armenia has taken a big step to at least accept in principle the need to reintegrate. Whether that grandiose scheme ever comes to fruition, that depends on factors well beyond the control of Armenia. Mm, okay. Uh, just to be clear quickly, Matthew, I mean, uh, you do not foresee any kind of return to conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, correct? I, I do not foresee that. Yeah, I think there are plenty of people in Armenia who would like that. 
and they're the ones who lost the election. <laughs> and and there's there's no way Armenia could really relaunch a war against Azerbaijan because it it no longer has the military capability to do so. Azerbaijan destroyed it. Right. Okay, Samuel. Let me ask you this. Let's look at Russia. Russia, right. as you know, is is very protective of its sphere of influence. You know, and that includes, of course, former Soviet states uh, like Armenia. So, does Russia really welcome reconciliation? between Ankara and Yerevan and, and Baku by default? Uh, or would Moscow kind of see that as, as a threat? So Russia is actually in some ways a supportive of Pashinyan, actually, because even though he took through over through a popular revolution, which is framed as a color revolution in 2018, a bit like Euromaidan in Ukraine, they like the fact that he was predictable. They like the fact that he's not going to start a new uh, conflict with Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, they viewed him more preferentially than Kocharyan, who's openly supporting him. So I think that the Russians are willing to accommodate uh, Pashinyan's uh, regional agenda simply because they have uh, trust that he's going to do so without jeopardizing their alliance with Russia. He's made some important stances of solidarity with Russia, for example, even deploying a peacekeeping contingent to Syria, which uh, put him in a lot of hot water with the United States. But if the uh, integration between Armenia and Turkey were to suddenly become a lot faster than one might expect, I think they would be quite concerned. Look at the reaction from the uh, Russians to the Turkish uh, base proposal in Azerbaijan last week. They were basically saying that Azerbaijan is going to become an extension of NATO or might even join NATO. That was being reported in some of the Russian defense circles, which is unrealistic, but it's being reported. Mm. So I think the Russians will be happy with modest integration, but not too far and not too much. Okay. Matthew, final thoughts there? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't just the former ambassador to Azerbaijan, but I was a Minsk group. So I was a mediator between Armenia and Azerbaijan with Russian and French colleagues. And I'd always felt that uh, you know Russia negotiated or helped facilitate the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan in good faith. Um, what that reflected to me was not that they necessarily wanted the conflict resolved, and they certainly don't want Armenia and Turkey to have a strong relationship. But Russia wanted to keep the pot stirred. And, but not boil over and, and into a war. So they're positioned for that right now. I think in the beginning or during the war, they really disliked Pashinyan because they thought he was reckless. They thought he provoked the war. But now, as Sammy was saying, Pashinyan is sort of their guy because he signed the, the agreement mm -hmm. that President Putin brokered. So they now need in Moscow, they need Pashinyan to survive. And as Sammy was saying, they know he's not going to restart a war with Azerbaijan. So, you know, there's no... No peace, no war is, is a good formula for Russia. Matthew Bryza, Samuel Romani, thank you both really so much uh, for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciate it. In the near future, not being able to provide proof of a COVID-19 vaccination might not only get you barred from hopping on an airplane, it might stop you from eating in a restaurant or going to a concert. In fact, that's already happening in Israel and Russia. The World Health Organization is not endorsing vaccination passports, paper or digital, for travel just yet, citing a list of concerns, issues around vaccine inequality, privacy, stolen or forged passports, as well as the lack of common standards and infrastructure, has turned what seems like a smart solution into a problem. We'll talk to a law professor and bioethicist about that in just a minute. But first, Natalie Pohonen explains how vaccine passports will work and who loses out by not having one. Heading to the airport and jetting away has seemed like a distant dream during the pandemic. For some of us, it's now turning into a reality. But there's a big change coming to how we'll get around in this COVID-19 world, because to check in, it's likely we'll need to show proof of vaccination. That's where vaccine passports come into the picture. Like a regular passport, it'll be a form of ID with your name, birth date, and crucially, data about your vaccination status. In some cases, this will be in a digital form, accessed through a QR code. You might need to show it not only to head overseas, but perhaps even to go to a concert, football game, or a festival. But needing to prove your vaccination status to enter a country isn't new. Some nations require travellers to have a yellow fever vaccine before they're allowed in, and those details are recorded in internationally recognised booklets that look like this. 
Right now, there's no global standard for a COVID-19 vaccine passport, so some parts of the world are going ahead and creating their own versions. From July, the EU's digital COVID certificate system will go live across the block. It will contain health information that's uploaded by member states and will show proof of one of three things. Either you've been vaccinated, returned a negative PCR test or recovered from COVID-19. The EU hopes these digital passes will help cross-border tourism and trade. While getting vaccinated might not be mandatory, proof that you have had your jabs does come with incentives beyond your health. EU member Lithuania launched its own version of a certificate in May called the Freedom ID. It can be used to get around restrictions on attending cultural events or indoor dining. What is most important probably is that uh, we have to encourage people to get their vaccine and this is an, an incentive for, for those who are not yet uh, got their vaccine to get vaccinated. But there are concerns that requiring proof of a jab could create two classes of people, those who've had access to shots and taken them, and those who haven't. And while vaccination campaigns have rolled out in many countries, particularly in the West, in other parts of the world, people are still waiting for doses to arrive. Which means that for millions of people right now, a vaccine passport is simply out of reach along with any of the benefits that come with proving their vaccine status. Natalie Perhanen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Boston is Glenn Cohen. He's a bioethicist and law professor at Harvard University who recently co-authored a paper called Digital Health Passes in the Age of COVID-19. Glenn, thanks so much for being with us. You know, knowing you how me. many millions of people have had to you know, prove that they were vaccinated for yellow fever, uh, with their WHO booklet to travel in sub-Saharan Africa, you would, you would have thought that with technology today, building a global system for proof of COVID-19 vaccination would be relatively easy. Instead, it's been so elusive and so controversial. Why? Well, I think it's controversial in part because it splits two different things. One is whether to require people to show vaccination and the other is how you require people. So a lot of the political pushback has been against so-called mandates. This idea that we are going to require it as a condition to enter a sporting event, to enter a country, to enter a workplace. And there's a real libertarian feel here that this is my body, I should make a decision. Also, these are relatively new vaccines, right? Their production system has been something we've seen in real time. And for many people, it's their first encounter with the ways in which medicine is done and drugs and vaccines are developed. And lastly, I think, you know, there is a strain of kind of COVID denialism and skepticism mm. and conspiracy theorizing that's also doing some of the work here. Uh, can I just ask you quickly, I mean, what do people have to be so scared of uh, when it comes to privacy concerns, given, you know, our information is already spread out across so many different platforms. It is. This is true, right? But, you know, people have a very special feeling about their health privacy and that of the things we try to protect. When we think about our physicians, for example, we have the Hippocratic Oath, we have certain fiduciary duties with them. And I think people are worried about being exposed. Now, to be truthful, I think of all the information you could have about my health, whether I'm vaccinated or not is relatively low level. You find that out. It's not like my life is going to go much, much worse compared to whether I have a disability or the like. Right. But I think people are just sensitive about this topic. And, and, you know, there's also, of course, the issues around who has access to the vaccine and which vaccine. How much discrimination might we be looking at according to access in poor countries as well as wealthier countries, non-approval uh, of vaccines, including Sinovac or, or Sputnik? This is, I think, the key ethical question, and that is the idea that there are people around the world who are literally dying to have a vaccine and have no access to it because of the ways in which we've distributed vaccines. That means what is already an injustice here might be compounded by the fact that not only do they not have a vaccine, but they can't get to one of our countries for work, for school, or the like. I do think the question about which vaccine should uh, qualify is a tricky one. My own sense, though, it is defensible to say, if I haven't approved a vaccine in my home country, then it's not one of the ones that should qualify for entry into that country. Okay. Uh, I have to ask you quickly, I mean, it's not just about privacy. There's also this issue that people have with, with hacking. 
Uh, does having this kind of digital beta database, does it, does it make us more vulnerable to hacking? I mean, am I being naive and not worrying at all about that? I think you should worry a little bit compared to your yellow booklet, right, where I have to literally pick your pocket to get the yellow booklet. It's certainly a more of an aggregation of information. That said, in the worst case scenario, I do think that instead of having a million of these vaccine passport systems, one for the bar, one for the sporting event and the like, which is something we're seeing in the United States, it's much better to have a single system that has very high cybersecurity it may also be possible to use technologies like blockchain and the like to give further security to these uh, passports. You know, also in the United States, I got to say, I was shocked when I saw the U.S. vaccination card. I mean, in, in some cases, it looks like a child could have made it on a computer at home. Uh, it's paper. It has no barcode. Uh, and all the information is just handwritten. And then you have, for example, the Turkish digital vaccine card. It's validated by the government. Uh, it's, it's far more difficult to duplicate. It has the, the, the barcode that can be read by a number of computers. How can that actually be reconciled when it comes to, you know, international travel and how strict can we actually expect border controls to be based on this huge differential? As you say, there's a real concern about forgery. We've seen people selling online blank such cards and the like, right? And I do wish the United States had built more of an infrastructure like Europe on this issue. I think there were some political reasons why they didn't. The Biden administration has not pushed vaccine passports really at all as an idea here. And I do think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Europe uh, from trade pressure and the like to accept the U.S. card, even though, as you say, it is fairly easy to mock up and to fake. But I do think when push comes to shove, uh, the EU is going to be pushed to accept it. Mm. And, and that's a bit dangerous. I, I, I mean, I would be worried if I were the EU and you're looking for, you know, if you want to control this pandemic, vaccine passports are important and a handwritten card just isn't good enough uh, in this day and age. But let me ask you this. I mean, how much are we actually learning from what's happened uh, to make us better prepared if it happens again? Because most scientists are saying it probably will. So I think we've learned quite a lot, although, again, the COVID uh, virus was such that uh, it was kind of unexpected in terms of the ways in which its symptoms manifested. I mean, we had SARS, we had MERS beforehand, which are somewhat similar. I think we need much better surveillance at the threshold. We need much more sharing of information. And I think the biggest failure we've seen actually has been in the manufacture and distribution of the vaccines. We did an amazing job. You'd asked me two years ago, would you be able to produce a COVID vaccine in this record time? The answer I would have said is, are you crazy? Nobody's ever done it. It's amazing what science accomplished, but we're seeing on the distribution end predictable failures in terms of who the winners are and who the losers are. Okay, so what are you expecting in the future? Like I said, I mean, what are the real lessons learned? What are we going to see differently from governments next time? Because some governments found themselves actually humiliated uh, in their management of the response to this pandemic. I think we should divide up the response to the pandemic and the vaccination process. In the vaccination, I think that you see the winners were the countries that got in early, that spent a lot of money, that did lots of advanced commitments. And that is in some ways unfortunate. That's the way it works, but that's the way of the world. So I think you'll see many more countries pushing for getting in there early, even if it turns out the vaccines don't pan out. In terms of control of the pandemic, I think one of the things we learned is we just didn't know what was happening when it was happening. Our ability to engage in surveillance, to genotype the virus and the like, is way below what we would like. And this is, a, but unfortunately, though, a true story about public health all the time. We overinvest in public health in the moments when there are crisis, and then the interregnum periods, we let them you know, die on the vine, essentially. And I think we need to make a real commitment to pay forward in this way. Mm. I mean, do you, what are your, what's your instinct telling you? Do you think it'll get better? Or if something worse hits us, which, like I said, some scientists are calling. They said, you know, we haven't even, this is nothing compared to, to what actually we saw with the Spanish flu, for example, and the, the number of the sheer proportion of people that it killed relative to the global population. Um, so if much worse is to come, are you feeling better ab about where we're going? I'm feeling better about the science side of it and that I think these mRNA vaccine platforms have allowed us to engage in a very nimble reaction and likely will be used in the future to do the same. So I think we'll be very well poised to kind of react scientifically. 
But I also sense a real sense of fatigue and maybe more here in the United States than elsewhere in that people are fed up at restrictions, even though these are restrictions that are saving many, many lives. And I have to say the amount of kind of discounting of the lives of older people, about people with disabilities that I've seen during this pandemic doesn't make me completely optimistic about human culture and human nature. Right. I mean, I, I'm just going to one last question on that, because you say there's there's is something specific about the United States. What is this resistance and why does it seem to be getting worse? Part of the issue is that I think the entirety of the COVID-19 pandemic was politicized to a much larger extent. We were in the middle of a presidential campaign when this uh, occurred, mm -hmm. and I think that's a problem. But in general, I think that there is a libertarian tendency in the United States relating to health and the government. You know, it is not a coincidence that we are one of the few very developed countries that doesn't have universal health care in this country, right? We are a place that has resisted governmental entry into health care, and that has extended now to public health. To me, grew up in Canada originally, that is a huge shame, but it is a reality here. And this idea that my body is sacrosanct and there's nothing you can do to my body and I will be the one to suffer and make decisions just doesn't gel well with public health in this country. Right, but in this case, it's not about your body. It is definitely about the greater good and how your choices can effectively actually kill other people. I completely uh, agree with you, but that's not the way many people in the United States see it. There's also some skepticism about these vaccines and about this process. And I think it was unfortunate in some ways. I think, you know, President Trump was the one who had this huge win. And I wish that people on that side of the aisle could kind of internalize that as a victory. But unfortunately, I think it's been politicized and many people were skeptical that COVID-19 was real or was doing the kind of damage it's actually been doing. Glenn Cohen, what a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much uh, for being with us on the Newsmakers. Really appreciate your insights. And thanks, of course, to uh, our viewers for being with us as well. We'll see you next time.